It's for him. It's for him. The difference between the Christian faith and every other religious group in the world is very clear. Jesus is in the room. We are the only movement in the history of the world where the founder attends every meeting. He said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, there I am. No sickness, no fear can keep the people of God from coming together to worship because Jesus is with us right now. He's right here. Hallelujah. You believe that? You believe that? I have so much to tell you that I got to get busy. You may be seated. When I look at this audience and how many of you have shown up, what a rebuke you are to modern California woke culture. You are a massive rebuke. Uh, I almost pity the folks that are holding on to some of that, but we're not going to spend a great deal of time. I'm here to build you up in your faith. I'm here to make you Satan's worst nightmare. I want you to become somebody that there'll be a little devil with a walkie-talkie at the end of your bed that has to warn hell that you woke up in the morning. How many of you want to be that red alert? They're awake. He's up. My wife and I are so thrilled to be with you, it's almost ridiculous. We are so in love with this church that, in fact, uh, I've decided to become a member of Destiny Church. And my wife and I are... Uh, that doesn't mean I'm going to tell the pastor what to do, that's for sure. But I've got several announcements. Our ministry nationally is blowing up. It is absolutely shocking. And so much so that I'm going to quit using the word absolutely. Uh, millions are watching us on our videos and our weekly appearances on Flashpoint. Uh, the crusades are overflowing. And I wouldn't be here if you weren't so special. This, how special are you? You're so special that I have a rule against preaching on the morning of a crusade. Tonight we begin at 655 41st Street, 4th Street, which is New Seasons Campus. Our tent is already up. We have uh, given away through Inner City Action and Frank Saldana the equivalent of five entire semi-trucks full of food. We have visited 10,000 homes. Tonight, wheelchairs are going to empty, blind eyes are going to open. It's going to be an amazing crusade. So you must be special for me to break the rule to be with you this morning. But this morning, I wonder if I might ask your permission to do something. Uh, I am going to preach to America, the American church. The American church. Destiny is the only church that I know of, sincerely, that could have pulled off with excellence what you did at Williams Jessup University. You started a national conversation. You have no idea. Millions watch those videos. And it has become the subject of a new conversation that Christian events can no longer focus on worship, focus on prayer alone, call for something of God to happen in the future. It is time for Billy Graham, Oral Roberts style crusades to come back into the stadiums and millions can be won to Christ. How many of you believe that? It's time. If you want to understand the impact you had through William Jessup University crusade, right now, our 
focus has been Highway 99 in California. Now the Lord has said, I want you to go across the nation with your tent, and I want you to begin to reach people in the non-Bible Belt areas, the areas that are known as leftist and woke. That's where the miracles are going to fall. And I said, okay, I am maybe know Sacramento is a pretty good start. If that's the criteria, we're going to break down the principalities and powers that have been been doing this stuff to us. We're going to break them down. Come on, give the Lord praise. We're going to break them down. We're going to break them down. Two major cities, Rochester, New York, and Buffalo, New York, in the Northeast, we announced that we would do a brunch for leaders. And as of right now, we have 600 pastors meeting us in the Northeast for a tent crusade this October. We just bought a new tent. Uh, it's going to be ready in two weeks. Our current tent is 8,000 square feet. Our new tent is 16,800 square feet. We're going to be able to handle thousands every night. And we're going to announce a crusade near Buffalo and Rochester October of this year. We're going to have our first Northeast tent crusade. And already we got 600 leaders involved. Somebody give God the glory. That's just... Amazing, amazing. And I am thrilled to be with Ralph on the keyboards right now. And I wonder if you'd take a moment and put your hands in the air and just say, Jesus, I love you. All my heart, all my mind, all my soul in, and I will serve you in the midst of the darkness I will serve you amen clap, clap, clap put a shout on top of it let's get busy our headquarters is going to move from Reno, Nevada we have already decided that our national headquarters is going to be in the Nashville, Tennessee area. And we are purchasing property to build a facility that will have several acres and central. But also, I'm not going to share this unless you get excited. But okay. We are also going to open a ministry center in Roseville, California. We're coming back to California. To God be the glory. So, what am I going to talk about for the next few minutes? I want you to look me in the eye and I want to tell you something. The year was 1941, and America changed overnight. There's a reason that Satan has provoked the teachers' unions to erase American history and tear down all the wrong statues. It's because when the first Americans founded this nation, they wanted two things, freedom to worship Christ and freedom to preach the gospel. When they set foot on American soil, that's what they made, a covenant. That covenant holds. You may want America to be atheistic, you won't get it. You may want America to be sexually perverted, not going to happen. Because you're not just dealing with with the lukewarm, divided church in America, you're dealing with a covenant. 
even when Israel didn't do what she was supposed to. And they opened the borders. And it seems the left is very concerned about not spreading COVID unless it comes through the border, then it's okay. And the rule of my body, my choice applies to abortion, but apparently not to the jab. And the argument that by resisting the jab, I'm killing people sounds very ironic coming from anyone who's pro-abortion. Let's see if they get that quote right. It's 1941, and Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. You won't get this in school. At the same time, Germany had just invaded several sovereign nations in Europe. 1941 was a terrible time to be a young person. Millennials do not have a copyright on fear and anxiety. One time Billy Graham was preaching to young people and he said, you understand fear? When I was a young person, Hitler was marching across Europe. What happened to America overnight couldn't have happened without an, a certain episode, an episode that has long been lost and forgotten. It had to do with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the corporate heads, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Bezos of that day. They weren't running Amazon or Facebook. They were running the Ford Motor Company, Boeing Aircraft, Kaiser Steel. They were running DuPont Chemical Company. And these four moguls, these giants, Theodore, excuse me, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected by slandering them in his campaign speeches. He called them robber barons. He said they're, they've corrupted, they were responsible for the Great Depression. So he made enemies of four men that he eventually is going to need more than anybody. Because in 1941, America had to build the war machine to save the free world had to do it. And so when Roosevelt sat with these men to say, our differences don't matter more than the threat to freedom. Now the woke don't believe they're a threat to freedom, but they are. They are distinct, present, clear, and present danger and existential threat to not only the liberty of worshiping as you preach, but also just essential civic rights where you can go. And Christians that have been supportive of some of these woke things tell me you're wrong to call the jab a form of the mark of the beast. They say that you're wrong to say that. And then I look at them and I said, in fact, they'll adamantly say, if it were the mark of the beast, I'd never take it. Well, you have to take it to get coffee. And if you can't resist it in order to go to Starbucks, how are you going to resist the Antichrist when he shows up? Because the argument then, the argument then will be just as compelling. Now, I'm going to tell you some more, and I, I want you to listen, because I'm going to get to this part that's very important, because I want you to understand this. It is the object of the left to teach theory as fact. And what you need to understand is when they use the term hate, because I'm a little worked up today, because now officially my pastor has been slandered by the Sacramento Bee. Okay. <clears throat> Hello. That changes things a little bit. The hate is preaching the Bible. I'm going to try this side over here. The hate is preaching the Bible, not adding, not subtracting, 
not inventing, not becoming hateful, preaching the Bible. And whenever I'm interviewed and they do that hit piece on me, they go, what is your opinion of homosexuality? They'll ask me that. What is your opinion? And I will honor, answer honestly. I don't have an opinion. I'm not entitled to an opinion. When I became a preacher, I lost my right to a personal opinion on any matter whatsoever. And I'm going to tell you what. But if you want to know what the Word of God says, and what we got to do is face it, folks. Why don't you put the Bible is a hateful book because that's the headline you are really saying. Because all we do around here at Destiny is preach the Bible. Somebody give God the glory. That's all we do. Franklin Delano Roosevelt must convince four men to build the American war machine. Men that hate him. But he has to describe it to them in a way that will make them make the difference. So today's sermon is entitled 50 Million Hand Grenades. How many of you know? That's a different title. I know. I'm going to say it like a preacher. 50 Million Hand Grenades. Thank you very much. Now, they must be made to see that their businesses, their very way of life, and their children's future will be destroyed. And in, in essence, there'll be no Boeing, there'll be no DuPont. If Hitler and the Japanese imperialist army win, there will be no DuPont. It won't exist. It'll be gone. The same applies to the pastor who is not willing to stand against the tide of the lies and the censorship that is going on in America. Your church is not going to exist. So the idea that you are being silent because you don't want your church to be divided or hurt is absolutely a double bind, what we call in debate and in, in uh, rhetoric, a double bind. You're not going to have a church. There's not going to be the freedom to worship in this country. And we are not the ones who are saying that. You don't even have to take it from me. Listen to media because that's what they want. They want the churches locked down. They, do you think that they locked us down simply because of a virus? Or that a mask is going to help us? You know, I wear a mask to prevent me from getting a virus. I also use a chain link fence to keep mosquitoes out of my yard. Now, the lot, anybody here right now? The point is, and all of you got to get it, that FDR had the same precise case to make that we need to make. The Baptist Church, the Assembly of God denomination, the Foursquare movement, all of us that claim to be Christian in America can no longer be neutral. We have to stand together as one against this tide of censorship and hatred toward Christianity. Somebody help me. Yes, we do. I don't care if you believe in pre, post, mid, millennia. It doesn't matter right now to me. I don't care if you believe in baptism by total immersion or by spot removing. I don't care because it doesn't matter. The look you need to look at, don't look at your ties. Don't look at your membership role. Do not look at how the press is treating you. Look in the eyes of your children and your grandchildren and tell them we are not going to leave behind a world without freedom of worship. No, we won't. No, we won't. F. 
FDR said to Boeing, Ford, Kaiser, and DuPont, four men, we must build the American war machine. So they had the scientists and the military scientists put together the plan. What will it take, given the assessment of Germany and Japan, to win? What do we need to do? And the assessment was amazing and astounding and what America did. So they're going through a line and they're showing the weapons that they want to build for the Second World War. And each mogul or titan is looking at one thing and they held up a hand grenade. And DuPont asked the question, how many of these will we need? And the army said, 50 million. And it was then and only then that the enormity of the task was understood. It was only then that they realized and calculated what was at stake, what will it take? What is at stake and what will it take? And this nation woke up. This nation woke up. And when it woke up, 14 million women went to work in factories. The Ford Motor Company began to build B-25s, one per hour, until they built 8,700 in the Kaiser shipyards here in the Bay Area. Two Liberty ships a day were being built from metal to frame to full of munitions and sent out the Golden Gate every day. Nationally, we were building seven of them. But FDR said we either build the machine of freedom or we don't. And right now the Holy Spirit is speaking to the American church, to the American church. We need to build the American revival war machine. And we need to build it now. And we need millions of us. I'm gonna keep, we need millions of us to stand up and say no. You're not going to give us this garbage. You're not going to give us this filth. You're not going to take. You're not going to take away our Bible. Somebody help me. God is speaking to the American Christian. It's not about you anymore. It's not for a for for a a moment where we can't deny anymore that the Bible is under attack. It's what the Bible teaches that the media hates. And the Bible's not just being attacked by them. The worst assaults on scripture are coming from within the church, not outside the church. The sacramental bee is just that, a bee. It's a buzz. You know, hey, relax, brother. I get hit by CNN and Newsweek. Not a bee in a Coke bottle. But, but I want you to know, brother, welcome to the wonderful club. Now, listen to me. We're getting... The Bible is getting hit from within the church. When this lie from the pit of hell that you could grow a church by limiting the number of verses you preached on because they offended, that is an assault on the word of God. You listen to Billy Graham in the 1950s, every other paragraph, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, how many of you believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God? How many of you believe it is the source of the standard? Many of you don't understand that in your Assembly of God association, that the Assemblies of God were born in a revival that really came out of the Holiness Church. And some of the most prolific theologians in our time came into Pentecost and brought with them a thing that you all haven't heard of in a while, perhaps. It's called doctrine. And when you look at Acts chapter 2, it gives you a list of the reaction of the people after the fire of God fell and thousands were saved. It says on the list, they met house to house. They had everything in common. They took care of every need. They had joy and gladness. 
What was on the top of the list? It says they gave steadfast attention to the apostles' doctrine. Shame on the American pulpit for not telling you why sin is sin, for not telling you why you stand against these things, for not arming you with the information. I was down there practically dancing when Kathy was standing here telling you the nine lies that are being told to you by the culture. The Bible is the best book ever written. And I and now it's being assaulted by those that said, don't put it in the pulpit. All of that has come back to haunt us. The Christians who didn't know how to vote were in churches that didn't know how to read the Bible. The, the Christians who didn't know what was right and wrong, who didn't stand against abortion, were not getting scripture from their pastor. They weren't getting the word of God. So I'm a part of destiny. I'm going to tell you what. This is a house where you're going to hear the Bible preached, taught every single service. We're going to fill you with the word of God. Come on. We're going to fill you with the word of God. Then the Bible got attacked by the prophetic movement. Oh, now I'm going to lose some fans now. Mara, don't go there. You got, you got my monthly offering. I'm, if you attack the prophetic movement, let me tell you something. When prophets run around saying, I've received a revelation that transcends scripture, or I can visit heaven whenever I want, because the, even though it's not in the word of God, I want you to, and then they'll tell you, are you going to believe this book? Or are you going to believe what I'm telling you God said? They're not telling you what God said. Let's take my book, Vessels of Fire and Glory. Someone holds it up to me and says, you know what? I like you, but I don't like this book you wrote. And I said, well, when you don't like my book, you don't like me. You know who wrote the Bible? The Holy Spirit. And when you don't like the Bible, you don't like the Holy Spirit. No, I worked hard on that one. Somebody said, Amen. The word of God, three sides, the press that wants it out because it's hate, but won't admit it. The pastors that left it out in order to grow numbers. The prophetic movement, which is trying to make the prophetic equal to or surpassing the word of God. And we got to get past that. But now I want to quote from the Bible. Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Listen to me. I maybe don't mind if I preach a little bit longer. Because I've got something. Thank you. And we give God all the glory to a frenzy of pouring evil into every American institution as fast as possible. Through the schoolroom, through politics, through law, through the legal system through entertainment. He's flooding American culture with evil. And the foundations are being removed. The basis of why we believe in marriage. Now, when you go on WebMD, and here is a website that is supposed to be neutral and safe, telling that we need to remove gender from our birth certificates. Now, that is evil flooding every institution. Now here's what happens. You can get shell-shocked as a believer. You can get shell-shocked by the enormity of what's happened overnight. What's happened with teachers' union and corporate greed that would choose to destroy the church in order to sell a sneaker or to sell a sport. And professional sports has been poisoned. You know, there's a rule of wokeness. Whatever it touches becomes miserable. They become a miserable athlete that doesn't win in the Olympics. Misery. Now, so the question is, if those foundations are flooded with evil, what can the righteous do? As a man of God, I've got to ask you, it's not fair for those of you that are young to have the weight of a nation on your shoulders. It's not fair for those of you that are in retirement and have labored the heat of the day 
to now be reinstituted into the front line of American life. It's not fair. It's not fair for me to look at a church that ought to be having fun for years in California. I've lived in California all my life. I'm glad to be moving back because I want to be one of the ones that isn't leaving. So when I say this to you, it's not fair. You have hopes and dreams and wishes, but so did they in 1941. And if they did not interrupt their lives, you would not have what you have today. So now it's our turn. It's our turn as a generation of American believers to tell our children and our grandchildren, you will have the freedom to go to church. You will have the freedom to say no. You will have the freedom to be safe. And we are not going to let the American dream die on our watch. Notice that Psalm 11.3 does not say, should the righteous do something? It assumes that. It says, what can the righteous do? And that is where we divide the churches that will be here in the future with his anointing and power and truth and those that will go by the wayside and be the tumbleweed of tomorrow. What should the righteous do? There's a little book called Born for Battle. Even though I wrote a book and I'm trying to sell it, I want to recommend another book. A little book that a lot of people have skipped over called Born for Battle, written by Arthur Matthews. And in the introduction of this book, you would think he had lifted in a time machine to this date in August in 2021 where he's explaining why he wrote Born for Battle, why he wrote this book. And listen to me. He said, I have the burden of the Lord. My burden relates to the flood of evil that the devil is pouring into the world. And at the same time, the passivity of many of God's saints as they view this state of affairs. And their ignorance of the part God expects them to play in this warfare against Satan. The question of the hour is, what is the role of the church in the flood of wokeness? Well, first of all, there is no greater contradiction than the term woke Christian. It makes as much sense as a screen door on a submarine. Everything in the word of God that you hold true is destroyed by wokeness. All the racism they deny is the racism they are. All of the censorship. The, I spent 10 years at Berkeley and the leftist radicals of the 70s would take a flamethrower to the woke people of the, this new millennium. You are everything they hated. You are the censorship you hated. Can you believe they called it the free speech movement? And the, now you want to gag everything. Now, the ignorance. Today I'm preaching about what role does the church take? What does the righteous do in this? The first thing, and this isn't the beginning of my sermon. I'm three quarters done right now. Please, don't. whenever a guy says the first thing, it doesn't mean it's the start. That was a long time ago. The beginning is the next thing he said. David said, what can the righteous do? And then he said, God is in his holy temple. Let me put that in modern language. Surely, David is innovating. The only thing the righteous can do is run. Buy a cabin. Fill a Grecian urn with brown rice and survive. I don't believe that. And David is saying, what can the righteous do? Do I run? And then he said, God is on his throne. 
And he's saying, God isn't running and neither am I. God isn't running and neither am I. Everybody that believes God is still on his throne, give him a shout. Give him a shout right now if you believe that God is still on the throne. Esther is our final character in this message today. And Esther began her career in a beauty contest. Began her career hoping that by being queen, she could lobby for the safety of the Jews. The American church had a purpose for its existence. And even Mordecai, getting back to Esther for a moment, went along with it. She is now the favorite. She's getting dressed and ready to meet the king. There was a season where that made sense to believe that Christianity was a beauty contest. There was a moment where we could have gotten away with saying, let's grow our church by being culturally, intellectually, socially, and with coffee. <laughs> Attractive to society. We beautified the gospel. We took some of the distinctives that made it unattractive to the California lifestyle. We engineered it a little bit. And Esther was in that pursuit. It was still righteous. She was still a woman of God trying to be moral and in a situation where favor would come to the faith of the Jews and the state of the Jews. And one day, Mordecai overhears something. He overhears something that instantly makes him a radical. He finds out that Haman has talked the king into committing genocide of the Jews. Now, getting the people to believe that, Mordecai and Franklin Delano Roosevelt are identical. One is convincing corporate heads. The other is trying to convince a young pretty woman that the beauty contest is over. It's now something different. That's what I'm up here in my fragmented and inferior skilled way trying to tell the American church the beauty contest is over. This is not a day. L listen to me. Your sermon on how to have the best vacation ever, your sermon about getting over your past, your sermon about seven ways to deal with depression, it makes no sense. It is absolutely irrelevant. It is out of whack. It is, it is an anachronism. Now the sermon is this. The devil is about to choke America and God is raising up an army to stop him. Somebody, somebody help me right now. There will never be a more controversial statement that I will ever make in my life than the one that is coming right now. While I was in Fresno, I asked the audience a question because there were 50 preachers in the room. And let me tell you something, I'm the friend of the local pastor. I need them to do crusades, but I don't just love them because I need them to do crusades. They fight an uphill battle. They're in, in, under incredible stress and pressure. But like any profession, not all of them are good. Not all evangelists are good. There's some that are corrupted in their means and in their values. But I'm very careful not to, not to paint with a broad brush many, many thousands of men and women of God behind pulpits in America that all they're looking for is direction. 
That's why nearly 600 of them are going to meet me in New York. Because what they're saying is we need direction. Arthur Matthews said, what is the role of the church in this hour? What does God want us to do about this thing? FDR, this is what you men have got to understand, that the world is totally changed. So Mordecai is telling Esther the same thing. Tell her this is what's happening. Now I want you to watch her initial reaction, and I'm going to throw Fresno in there. I'm not being bipolar right now. I'm keeping track of everything I'm trying to say. And, and I don't need to cast any aspersions on anyone, but it is essential that you hear this part. I looked at the audience and I said, how many of you here have lost your job for witnessing to cry about Christ on the job? Hands went up. How many of you have had a child suspended from school for wearing a scripture t-shirt or a Christian t-shirt? Hands went up. How many of you have had your social media data mined and used against you even from 10 years ago where you commented while you were working for a high-tech company your viewpoint on marriage being biblical and it was used against you? Or currently, the health workers who are being threatened in Sacramento for their jobs to be taken away. Now, you think I'm talking about the Soviet Union. Now, at this moment, I said to them, pastors, how many sermons are you preaching about what your people are actually going through? And what are you giving them that makes them strong in their culture? That's why, as I said before, I was dancing when Kathy was up here announcing the nine lies that the culture are telling you and the scriptural answer. That's what every church should be doing right now. It's what every, every church in America. What is the initial reaction going to be to lukewarm Christians when they read the headline of, that was against your pastor in the San Francisco buzz? I mean the Sacramento Bee. What is their initial reaction? Oh my God, we Christians, we look bad. Well, by being silent, you look stupid. You really do. You look stupid. Now, when you keep your church closed, you're sending a signal that you don't care about your people. That's the most controversial thing I can say. You may think that you're couching it in, oh, well, I want to do what's right for the health department. I want to look good in the eyes. But your people read it. I needed church. I needed to be in church. I needed to sit with other like minds. I'm getting assaulted by something far worse than a pandemic, and that's the epidemic of wokeness that is coming like a toxic cloud over everything. I needed church. I needed worship. I needed to feel the presence of God with fellow believers. Now, Esther finds out that Mordecai is running through town screaming. Finally, he puts on sackcloth and ashes and begin sobbing out loud. Think of the modern preachers that would have looked at Mordecai and called him a radical, an alarmist, an extremist, and say, your, your statement about what's going on in America isn't true. Mordecai would have heard the same thing, a conspiracy to kill all of us? Are you crazy? But he was right. There's only one conspiracy theory that was really, really bad. And that was the conspiracy theory that told us that Joe Biden would be good for the United States of America.
the, the news gets back to Esther. Two things she finds out. Number one, about the genocide. Number two, that the man she really loves, Mordecai, is wearing sackcloth and wailing in the center of town. So she's so distressed that she sent garments to Mordecai. That's what's going on right now. She sent him glad rags. Put the glad rags on. Wear the clothes you wore before the pandemic. Wear the theology, the values. We just want everything to get back to normal. Let's, I want it like it was before. I want la, 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 la. I just want it to go back to the way it was before. So that's when Mordecai comes back to her. And she explains why she can't take action. Don't you understand what the law says? The law says I can't go to the king and tell him about the genocide of our people because I will be executed. I might lose my life. Well, Esther, if they're going to exterminate all the Jews and you're Jewish, And that's the logic that is keeping men of God quiet right now. Last week, I got to spend time with General Michael Flynn. Yeah, I did. And we talked about America. And when he was done, we knew we all had to do something. Now, here's the part. It says Mordecai leaves no doubt about her need to test the law. The Sacramento Bee said about the pastor's preaching, he's testing the law. Mordecai was telling Esther, you got to test that law. There's a law you have to test. You have to test the law that puts a drag queen to read to your children on Saturday in a library. You have to test the law that will put a grown man in your little girl's bathroom. You have to test the law. You have to test the law. You have to be the voice at the city council, at the school board meeting. You have to be the individual that says, I oppose this. Now, my church has stayed close because it's the safe move. I'm not speaking out because it's the safe move. I, as a personal Christian, don't want to rock the boat. That's the safe move. Here's what Mordecai said to Esther, who was speaking of, self-preservation. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace. FDR said to the moguls, don't think that you can look at me and say, oh, I'm going to keep building cars. I'm Ford. I'm going to keep making plastic and nylon. I'm DuPont. I'm going to keep delivering the mail. I'm Boeing. The president said, none of that will be here if we do not confront this threat. It's not going to be here. So finally, Mordecai said, you're not going to be safe in the palace if this edict goes forward. What can the righteous do? Oh, I have such good news for you. What can the right? How many of you are ready to have some fun? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. How many of you are ready to have some fun right now? I'm going to close my notes because it give you the false idea that I'm done. Can't possibly say more. He's got no notes. No, I do want to finish, but I, I've got to say this. How many of you want to have fun? Raise your hand, do you? Wokeness is going to be defeated in California. It is. It's going to be defeated. I'm going to tell you, it is going to be defeated. What is going to happen in these closing moments is this. I want you to sign up right now to be a part of God's invading army of love. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses 
kind of led us to believe that going door to door was a bad thing. They ruined it. So we've been down in the Elk Grove area going door to door. Yeah, we have been all summer. Frank and his team have been there all summer. They've given away boxes of groceries to the poor in Elk Grove area that would fill five semi-trucks. Somebody clap for the Lord. Yes, they have. And you know what's happening? And am I preaching the truth here, Frank? Instead of resistance, they're opening the doors. Thousands of them. They're in tears that someone is praying for their family. They're getting saved. One lady, her name is Pat. A little lady in the inner city who lost her sight can only see shadows. One of our workers who flew in to volunteer on the streets laid hands on Pat and her eyesight was restored. And our workers lost her. Now, there is a small minority of people with a loud amount of power, the Zuckerbergs, the Bezos, the individuals, that, the George Soroses of the world that have a loud noise, but they don't have our numbers. In fact, I no longer call the righteous in America a remnant. I don't use the term remnant. There are too many of us to be a remnant. And there is going to come that moment when signs, wonders, and miracles are going to break out everywhere. And we're going to watch it in the name of Jesus. Somebody clap and give Christ the glory. Everybody stand to your feet. Give Christ all the glory. Give him praise. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God. Destiny Church is a model for thousands of other churches across America. The Bible tells us that when Paul was in jail, he said, he wrote to the Philippians in the first chapter in the 11th, 12th verse, and he says to them, I want you to know that my imprisonment has had the opposite of its intended consequence. Its intended result has backfired. He said, and my brethren, seeing my chain, have become more bold to preach. And the witness of the gospel has actually gone forward. So this crowd today is a testimony to what happens when the media attacks the church. It becomes stronger. It becomes more joyous. It becomes more prosperous. It becomes more influential. We are starting to win this war. Bow your heads a moment, if you will. Lord, I pray divine healing to fall on this entire audience. I pray, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit to so indwell and remove fear from everyone. We are at that moment of Acts chapter 4, verse 29 and 30. Lord, behold the threat and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may preach your word while you stretch out your hand to heal and let signs and wonders be done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Father God, we bear the reproach of the gospel in our day. We do it joyfully. We do it mightily. We do it with absolute Surrender to your will. Now, with every eye straight ahead, I'd like you to look at me for a moment. I deliberately tried to sober you up a little bit today, but I hope you understand that this message ends in hope. Tremendous hope. Because we did win that war in 1941. We did defeat the enemy. And in the spirit, we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to do it again.
But now I want to zero in on you as an individual. I want to zero in on you over here as an individual. The power of God is trying to speak to you like Esther, but it is a different message than what she received. Esther was told by the Spirit of God through Mordecai, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. It is not by coincidence that you are beautiful, that you have favor, while the darkest threat to the Jews has come. That's all a part of something divine. That's the same thing that is going on right now in your life. God had you in this church today to hear this message today, given all of the factors of your life. You see, what's lacking in your life is the reality. See, everything has been beaten up and diffused and artificially and made virtual to where it's hard to know what's real from what's not. And what's real is the love of God. There's nothing more real. And once you've experienced the knowledge that God loves you, it is the most astonishing thing. There's nobody that has ever verbally done that experience justice. No one's ever written it or said it quite to the degree that it deserves. It revolutionizes you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. When the love of God strikes your life and you know that God has something waiting for you, regardless of how old or how young, how many times you fail, how many times you've fallen, that there is something indescribably wonderful waiting for you. But you have got to reject your fear. You've got to reject it. So what I'm going to do is tell you this. The power of Jesus will remove your loneliness, your depression, your fear, your guilt, and your anger, and your addictions. Society is so part. Descartes departmentalized, there it is, that you have to go to one therapist for this, one other specialist for this. You have a life coach, you have a counselor, you have a therapist, you have this, you have that, you have all of them. Nothing is so self-inclusive as the gospel because when Christ touches you and touches your life, it touches everything. It fixes the relationship, the emotion. And there's actually physical healing available in the Christian gospel. It's all there. But it's not without a price. You have to repent. You have to admit you are wrong. And you will not negotiate with Christ. He is Lord or he's nothing. He becomes all or he's nothing. But when he becomes all, you will declare without a doubt, this is the best and the most powerful thing I could have ever done. And I want you to do it right now. So with every eye closed, nobody looking around, close your eyes, everyone. In a moment, wherever you are standing, I'm gonna ask you to put your hand in the air. And when you put your hand in the air, here's what you're saying. I want my past erased. I want my fear removed. I want the peace and the joy that comes from being right with God to flood my being. And today is my day to enjoy the first day where I am not afraid, alone, controlled by destructive forces. I belong to Christ. I'm going to I'm going to ask you right now, wherever you're standing, Mario, would you ask Christ to help me? Would you ask Jesus, would you agree with me in prayer? Matthew 18, verse 19 and 20 says, if any two of you shall agree as touching anything on earth, it will be done. And wherever you are in this auditorium, 
if you say, Mario, pray with me because the miracle you're describing is the one I need in my life right now. Pray for me. Put your hand in the air if you let me pray for you. Of all of you that are, have your hands raised, and there are many of you, I want you to make your commitment to Christ. And if you haven't done that, and, I, and you have not done that, and you need to do that today, please, your hand is raised, step out of your seat, get to the nearest aisle, and walk down here quickly. Don't wait. Don't wait for someone else. <clears throat> you come. You come from wherever you are. You come now and don't be afraid. Don't fear. Don't hold back. Come. To God be the glory. And I'm going to ask Pastor to come to the stage. Please come. Get to the nearest aisle and make your way up here. Don't resist the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you feel a victory in the spirit world right now? How many of you feel the victory? Keep coming. And right now, raise your hands, everyone, as the healing hand of God falls on this audience. The healing hand of God over cancer, over disease. If you surrender all and you become a living sacrifice, then you will witness the Lord raise up the temple of your body for his honor and his glory. Thank you, Lord, for restoring health for bringing healing virtue, Jesus, over so many. We thank you, God, for your mighty power. Now, at the end of that prayer, I need everyone to look this way. You belong with this happy group. You belong with this happy group. You belong with this happy group. When the Lord spoke to you to give your life to him, you did what you've done so many times in your life. That opportunity for peace and joy, something stopped you right at the end. Don't let it. Walk up here right now. You say, Mara, I belong up there getting the happiness and the breakthrough these people are getting. So come. Come and be with us right now. That's it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Now with your hand over your heart, all of you here, audience, join in in this prayer. Say, church, join in with them and say, Lord Jesus, let your spirit flood me now. I confess my sin and turn from my way to your way. I am now your child. Wash away everything that is evil and wrong and make me a new creation. I know that you rose from the dead. I know that you are the Lord. And I will walk with you every day of my life. Amen. Every eye straight ahead. Everyone listening very carefully. None of what I preach today, and we've got to take care of these people more than anything, is intended to create discouragement or fear, but to awaken action. In the coming days, God's going to speak to you about what to do to be a part of the miracle of the new America. 
But there is coming a day, and you and I are going to see it. There'll be a day when I will stand in this pulpit, and we will all reflect on that Sunday, this Sunday, on the 8th of August, when the turning point began. And it, was, came, it came out of this building. And we're going to rejoice at new elected officials. A new rebirth of morality. And the breaking of the censorship of the righteous. Now give your attention to pastor as he comes to minister to these and dismiss you.